Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm going to make sure that we are streaming on Facebook right now. And how are you guys doing? How's your weekend going? We are talking about the truth about marriage. So many young people wonder um, about marriage and they wonder like, okay, what, like, what's, what's it about marriage? What am I supposed to expect? And how or what is marriage? Is it what we read in novels? Is it um, exactly how we see it on social media? What is it about marriage? Today, we're going to be talking directly, clearly about some of the things that you know and some maybe you don't know. So we're going, we're going to jump right into it without wasting any more time. I'm going to introduce us. Welcome to the DLBC Singles Group page. It's going to be also on YouTube. We are also on Instagram and on Twitter. And so if you are just finding us for the first time, uh, we talk about relationship, we talk about marriage, finding the right person to spend the rest of your life with, and what is Christian marriage. Uh, that's Those are some of the topics that we talk about. So today, I'm just going to put this out there and clearly place emphasis on this fact that marriage is a significant life commitment. And there are some important things to know about it. Before you jump into marriage, there are important things to know about marriage. I know some people believe that they can learn as they go. Um, yes, you can. But if, if you have the opportunity of getting yourself much more ready, why not, right? As, as I always say, mentor, that's the advantage of mentorship, right? If you have a mentor, your mentor guides you through um, the process of whatever it is that you are trying to do. Like one of my mentors always says, do not reinvent the wheel. So, there are individual differences in marriage. Before you get married, you, it's two people coming together, right? And each marriage is unique. Do not ever compare your marriage to the marriage of another person. Because each individual marriage is unique. It is shaped by two individuals who came together because they believe that they have shared values. They believe that they have shared goals. They have the same belief. They have maybe different experiences, but they expect that their experiences are going to somehow guide them or carry them through the marital um, um, journey or route. So there's no one size fit all in marriage. There is no one size fit all approach. And what works for one couple may not work for another. Uh, so as a woman, first, you need to know that you need to enjoy your single life. OK, now that you are single, make sure that you enjoy your single life. Have as much fun as you can. And that's not saying that marriage is not fun. It's just to let you know that marriage comes with responsibilities and you let go of certain lifestyle. And because you're going to be responsible for children, you're going to be responsible for your husband, who is your first child. Yes, so many people don't understand this. When you get married, the first thing that you'll notice is that um, your husband is your first child. He'll ask you for everything and anything. You'd have to be the think tank. He, you, he is also the think tank, but you will also have to be the think tank. So when you're getting married as a woman, you need to know that you need to come ready in your mind. You need to know that the life that you are living as a single person it's no longer the same kind of life that you'll be living as a married person. Things will have to change. There's going to be a lot of adjustment. And the, the period of, ad of adjustment will come to you as a married woman. I'll talk to the woman first and then I'll talk to the men. And that period, sometimes some ladies don't um, find it easy, don't find it fun. And that's where the beginning of adjustment starts in marriage. Lots of things will change in your life. When you wake up will change. When you go to bed will change. Your responsibility will change. 
And it depends on the kind of man that you marry, right? Some men are very meticulous, very neat, very clean, very organized. And some other men are the other way around. Maybe very disorganized, not as neat as you expect. You'll find a grown man mixing dirty clothes and clean clothes together. And you as a woman have to figure out which one is clean, which one is dirty. <laughs> These are some of the things that many people go into marriage and they don't know these kind of things. And as a woman, if you're very clean and very organized, you might be pissed off, right? You might be like, what? You're a grown man. Why are you doing this? It's your responsibility as a woman to be the, the homemaker. You make the home beautiful as you want it to be. As my mom once told me, make your home the way you want it to be. If you want your house to be organized a certain way, make a commitment that this is how I want my house to be and this is what I'm going to do to make it happen. And if you come into the marriage with that mindset that this could happen, you won't be shocked. You won't be disappointed. You won't be always offended and touchy. You won't be, you know, always angry because you already know that these are some of the things that I will expect in this marriage, in this home. So what your husband is, you women out there listening to me, men, I'm going to come to you very soon. If you're a woman, I just want to tell you clearly that what you look at, that handsome, good looking man, is until you get married to him, until you come really close to him, that you begin to understand that that well-packaged, handsome man is just a human being and he has his own flaws. He has his own weaknesses. He, he has a lot that he's expecting you to do for him. You practically become his mama. You become his mother. There's a lot of things that you need to do as a woman. So you need to be ready, emotionally ready, mentally ready to get into marriage. So many friends of mine have gotten married and um, at some certain point, they start feeling this depression and sometimes it comes after a baby, right? There's so many things that will happen to you as a woman when you get married. So there's emotional and com and commit commitment to partnership. There's emotional partnership that should exist because marriage is a deep emotional and commitment in the area of partnership. And it's be between two people. It involves love. You must love this person that you're getting married to. Don't in any instance get married to someone that you don't love. There should be trust. You cannot be marrying someone that you do not trust. Otherwise, you always live in suspicion. You need to trust this person that you're getting married to. You need to respect this person. Okay? Men love respect. They want you to talk to them a certain way. They want you to um, relate to them a certain way. Of course, most men in most marriages in most relationship the man is older than the woman right and no matter the race no matter the culture um as much as women they, you know i hear people saying that women needs to be respected too but when i say respect a man wants you to look up to him and he wants you to consider him as the head of the home so when when a woman now wants to be competitive and wants to share headship with him then there's conflict. There's conflict because he starts to feel that um, his ego is being attacked and that his headship is, is being, you know, touched or affected. So when I say respect, I mean, normally I expect people to be respectful. On a normal day, I expect that human beings should relate with one another with respect. Talk to people, please, can I have this? Please, can I, can you give me this, right? And some people look at respect in the sense that when you're going out, they expect you to let them know where you're going and so that they're not looking for you. And they want you to tell them ahead of time. They want you to uh, let them know that this is where I intend to go so, 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 and so date. A man doesn't like you to just fall on him and he just finds you dressing up and off you're going. Like you do as a young lady. 
right? As a young lady, you owe nobody an explanation, especially if you're living alone, maybe you're working in another city and your parents are not there. Um, you, you dress up and then you go. You don't need to ask anybody for explanation. You don't need to tell anybody where you're going. You just need to go. You go. But when you get married, you now have to explain where you're going to. You now have to say when you're coming back. You now have to take some permission for even money that you spend that belongs to you. Those are some of the things that you start to do that will start to change. It depends on the man that you marry. So, man, so men don't really care about your money. They don't look at how much you earn and they feel that it's their responsibility as it is definitely a responsibility of the husband to take care of the home. And they don't mind what you earn and what have you. But some people have just believed that they should have some kind of courtesy to let their husband know that, oh, I'm planning to change um, maybe the a couch or I'm, trying, I'm planning to change, I don't know, whatever it is. Maybe they have more money and they want to change the car or even, you know, make some changes. They, they let the man know so that he's not surprised when he comes. He's not surprised that you made some changes without asking him or without telling him, informing him, carrying him along. That's the term. They want you to carry them along every step of the way. And some men look at it as their way of showing you that they love you and that they're interested in everything about you. Marriage involves mutual support. You need to mutually support each other. You used to take care of yourself before. You used to cater to your needs. You used to um, think alone. If you have a project to do, you, you get some friends to help you or you just do it all alone. But now as a married person, there's something that your partner has that you don't have. There is something that they know that you do not know. There's some contribution that they can bring into the marriage that you need to ask some women who have lived alone, who have taken care of themselves and who know how to, their way around, I know you used to ask him, but your man expects you to ask him for support. And that asking for support, even if you know how to do it, even if you, you have figured it out, is just you showing that you admit that now you guys are married and you are interested in letting him, letting him support you the way he can. So it's an ongoing effort. Marriage entails an ongoing effort. Okay, You make an effort every day. As a man, when you marry, you know that now you have to cater for a family. You have to protect that family. You have to protect her reputation. You have to build integrity and maintain integrity. Men have a lot on their shoulders when they get married. It's, it's just the fact. Once you get married as a man, as the Bible says, you have to take care of your home. You have to take care of a woman. She's no longer asking her father for everything, asking him for advice. When I say many ladies depend heavily on their fathers for counsel. And some men, after they get married to a lady, they don't feel happy when their spouse or wife is still asking from their father for advice. They, they feel, okay, so what's, I'm here. I'm your husband. We're supposed to do it together. And they feel like, what's their usefulness, right? So there's a lot on your shoulders as a married man. When you get married, it comes with a lot of responsibility. You have to mentally get ready for it. Your life has to change. It cannot be the same. It definitely, absolutely cannot be the same. So if you're that kind of person that believes that, no, you can't give me that responsibility. No, you can't expect me to cater for your needs. A certain kind of woman will feel that you not, you're not the kind of man that they want. Not, and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that women should not contribute or women should not do anything to make the family go smoothly or to contribute to the family's needs. No, that's not what I'm saying. But the main things, like I was discussing with a friend and she told me that she works. She contributes to, the, to some things in the family, but she takes care of the small, small things in the family. Like maybe insurance for the car, 
like maybe if you shopping like food once in a while when you have to buy food and stuff, the little credit cards. But the main things that the family needs, like the mortgage or the rent for those who are renting, the man takes care of that. The man takes, takes care of, of buying the car. Okay, he own, he's the one that buys the car that the family uses or the cars that the family uses. Some women buy their cars themselves, but many men like to do it. The man takes care of um, the school fees of the kids, right? The man takes care of all the big bills, the light bill, electricity bill, heating bill for those who are living abroad, for air conditioning, um, internet, all the big, big things, the big bills are on his own account or on the family joint account. In their own case, they had a joint account and each person had their own separate account. So it depends on what your family decides to do. It's either you do joint account or you know individual accounts and then a joint account. You must always have a joint account where all the needs of the family, you know, you know how everything goes through it. The bank, the, the um, bills run through that main account and everybody, you all know so that you're not late on certain things. So as a man, you already know that when I'm getting into this marriage, mentally, I'm getting ready that there's going to be responsibility. Well, there are times when a man is building towards getting somewhere. Maybe he's a medical doctor, he's a lawyer, and then you travel out here and you're still doing your whatever course you are doing to get accredited to work in that country, it's understandable. The woman understands that at this point in time for a couple of months or a year, I need to step in and take care of some things, okay? Because my husband is trying to um, write his exams so that he can become a practice in a certain country where we are living. But after a certain time, the woman knows that within this time frame. I have to step into these big shoes that my husband occupies and it's a privilege to do it. And whenever it's going to, within that time frame, one year, he, he will take over, okay? So, because I'm going to tell you this, okay? Some people might not like it, but it's the fact. If you as a man abdicate your responsibility of catering for the family, over time, I'm telling you this as a woman, over time, the woman's comportment might start to change. Because that's just the natural way God has created it. The man caters for the home. The woman is not the one that cares for the home. And I've, I was listening to um, a podcast of a man that talks about finances and all these things. And this man was saying, he had this conversation with a couple and it was when he talked with them that he realized that there was a conflict going on. Silent, cold war was going on in that home because the woman, the roles were, were, you know, upside down. The woman works. She has a very good job. She works. She does everything. And then the man is the one that takes care of the children. He had to quit his job because he felt his job was not paying enough. And then he took care of the children. He cleaned the house. And then whenever the lady snaps at him, he felt bad. He began to feel like, man, I'm a man. Uh, because she was, she, she was just touchy. And then as they got talking, in debt, they realized that the man needed to go back to work. This counselor told him, he said, my man, go back to work. No matter how little it is you bring home, Find a nanny, find somebody to take care of these kids. You need to go back to work. You've done this for two years. You can't keep doing this. It's creating a rift in your relationship because the lady feels, because she blotted out and she said, oh, I work very hard. You know, I, I bring all the money in. And so I want to know how the money is spent. I, 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 I just don't like it when he just keeps spending money. Wow. That's just a woman. Men have a very large heart. Sometimes they look away, right? They don't, they might not say anything about, you know, how you spend the credit cards, you know, just spend, spend, spend. Some men can talk, but some other men don't just say anything. They let you spend and, 
at the end of the day, he balances the account, right? But the woman, <laughs> many women don't, they, they just become touchy. They just feel, oh, the money has been sent this way and they want to micromanage it and they want to look at it and, and they just feel like, I'm not the, why, why am I doing this? You know, and, and then it's odd. The man also just, it just doesn't sit well for a man to feel like his wife comes home and she's not really doing much with the children. Because it's just natural for the woman to be the one to take care of the home, take care of the children, you know, just even if she's working, like it's just, it's just a natural setting, right? You just see it happen in, in most homes. So just keep in mind that marriage requires an ongoing effort. You need communication, open communication. And you need to make effort to make or maintain a healthy and a fulfilling relationship. If your marriage is going to work, you have to determine that this marriage is going to work. You're merging your lives together. It's a merging of two lives. Financial responsibility, goals, decision-making, assets debts and every future planning you have to do it together so many women come into marriage not knowing that the man they're getting married to has some debts well remember that as soon as you get married the debts that he has becomes your debts you need to learn to have an open mind. And that's why I always say to people that are courting, be open. Share. Let the woman know. You don't have to be ashamed about your debt. Let her know. This is how much I owe. This is how, how much debt I, I owe. And this is, I'm saying this because of those people here in the diaspora. You, some people have line of credits and they have heavy loans, like 100,000, lots of money that they are owing. And they feel, okay, I'll pay it, I'll pay it. And they don't, think that they should tell the woman about it. That's a very big danger. Because when you come into that marriage, the woman will get offended. She'll be irritated. Because when you go to the bank, you realize that the bank will tell you that that debt cannot, like they can't take your name out of it. Somehow it's attached to you. A friend was advising another friend. This man had debts. He was always not paying his taxes. And I'm talking to those in the diaspora. He was always not paying his taxes at the end of every year. You know, when we file our taxes, if, if, if you have not contributed enough tax at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, the government gives you an amount to pay. And this guy was not paying it. He will be accumulating it. And he was making good money. He just would not pay enough taxes. And then when the government gives him the tax that he needs to pay, this guy will not pay. Another accounting, accountant friend told her, hey, you have to make this man pay his debts. You think it doesn't matter because it's under his name, but it's going to come back to haunt you. Why? Because at the end of the day, when the debt accumulates so much, what happens is that they might come for your house. The house that you both bought together might be taken away by the bank. The government will come for whatever it is that you have as assets together. Is going to haunt you. It's going to hurt you. You see that your finances now become merged together. You become one in everything. Just like the Bible said, the two become one. You now become one in that relationship. That's why you need to be opened. There is nothing to hide. Okay? Marriage is an opportunity to grow. To. Nobody may tell you some of these things about marriage. One thing that you don't know that many people will not tell you is that when you come into marriage, you think that, oh yeah, we're going to have sex, sex, sex. But you and your spouse might not be on the same financial, sex, I mean, sexual need. I said financial. Finance must be in my head right now. <laughs> so your sexual needs might not just be the same. So but you have to understand that what you thought that it's marriage, it's not really it. People don't have sex every day in marriage. That's not true. 
So if you're coming into sex with, if you're coming into marriage with the thought that, oh, I'm going to have sex every day, you might be disappointed. You might definitely be disappointed because responsibility comes. Women have hormones. They don't feel like it. Men are busy. Maybe whatever happens, things happen. Life happens, right? So you have to be ready to know that, okay, there are times when, or my partner might not be at the same emotion of an um, sexual need as as me and that's the place of understanding you have to come to a point where you understand each other you admit that okay let's have a conversation and let's agree when we can meet each other's need and you need to be vocal as a man you don't you have to speak out if you're a woman and you you you, you find yourself with a man that is not so much into it you should be able to open up and say, oh, I have a need, right? So some people are ashamed, but know that when you get married, there is no place for shame, okay? The Bible says that they were naked and they were not ashamed. So once you get married, there is no longer the place of shame. So openness, that nakedness, nakedness of emotions, nakedness of requests so openly be able to express your needs without feeling bad we spiritual sisters feel oh i'll be carnal if i ask no you wouldn't be in the confines of marriage you're not carnal if you have an emotional need a sexual need okay that's why we get married Okay, so over time in marriage as a woman, you get used to each other and that, I don't know how to explain it, like that, that jittery feeling will no longer be there two years after marriage. Because you have gotten older, you have gotten used to these things and sometimes it might look like as if your attraction has waned. And this person is still that very handsome, beautiful woman, handsome man that you married. But nobody will tell you that even though you've married a very handsome, a beautiful man, that it might start to feel like as if it's waning. But now what keeps you in the marriage is the decision and the reason. You always ask yourself, why did I get married to this person? And the first thing starts. You fall in love with your partner's soul. Not the person's outlook. Not the person's body. Not the person's outward appearance. But that person, the real individual. That's what you fall in love with. And when you fall in love with that, no matter the shape that they get, of course, that happens most to women. After they get married, they get bigger. That figure eight might no longer so much be there anymore. The flat tummy might no longer be there anymore. And the lady is big and she's not as stoned. Her skin is not as stoned as it used to be, firm as it used to be. She's put on some weight. She's put on some baggage from childbirth. But if you married her because of her shape, then you become touchy. You start to nag her. And you start to complain about how she looks. And you're unhappy all the time. And then you start to look outside. And you start to admire the lady that is still unmarried in your office. Or even another lady that is married. And for some reason, maybe her genes do not allow her to put on weight. But then you have married the original, the soul of that person. The person, the person herself, not us. Not the outwardness. And then you have decided and made up your mind. That however this person look, whatever I find in this marriage, at the end of the day, I'm not going out. There is no way out of this marriage. We're going to work together to look good. Okay. And it could be the man also that put on some weight and get the belly, the, the big pot belly and maybe start getting bored. Right. <laughs> but the fact remains that even when he has become bored, even when he has a pot belly, even when she has become big and no longer as young and pretty as she used to be, she's still the woman that you married. She's not changed. 
Another thing I'll tell everyone, both men and women, and I will talk more to the women, is how you relate to your in-laws matters a lot. You need to relate with them in wisdom. No matter how nice they are, no matter how familiar you get with your in-laws, remember to relate with them with respect, with caution. Remember that your in-law is always your in-law. Father, mother, sister, brother-in-law, your in-laws will always be your in-laws. Treat them nice. You mind what you say. You mind how you talk. You mind how you relate to them. Because at the end of the day, your husband will never abandon his family. They leave you, as the Bible says, we leave to cleave, right? But their family is still a part of them. No matter how you put it, no matter how you say it, no matter how you look at it, a family where anybody is born will always, always be a part of them. Whether male or female, you learn to love your in-laws and don't cross your boundaries. If you know this, my brother, my sister, especially my sisters, if you know this, you wouldn't have problem. I always tell one person that I really love, I always tell her this, I say, look, be careful what you say to your in-laws. And I'm not saying that be suspicious with them, but there's a way you will talk freely with your own family members that you can easily criticize one another and can fly and you guys joke about it and everything. But you cannot go and make those kind of jokes with your in-laws. They will not take it kindly. Right? It will not sit well with them. And many years after down the road, it will come back to bite you or to hunt you. You can be best friends with your in-laws if you relate to them with wisdom. I have good relationship with my in-laws because I know my limits. I don't cross my limits. Okay? I don't go searching to see the chat group of my husband's family and what are they talking about and what have you. No. Stop these things. Women like to poke nose. You like to poke nose into things that does not concern you. And some women, when they read these things, they don't know how to control themselves. Oh, are they asking for this? Why do you have to contribute this? Why do you do this? Why did that? No, 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 no. If you and your husband have a good relationship and you have built a certain level of trust, whatever he discuss with his family, he will eventually come and tell you. But when you go about sneaking and trying to read what they say on their chat and try to know what they say over there, and then you start getting annoyed and offended, you just be having unnecessary problems. But if you know and understand that that's his family, and if there's any financial thing we need to talk about, he'll bring it to me and we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. So be wise in relating to your in-laws. Give them, treat them as you would treat your own family members. Consider them as your own family. Just look at them in that way, like, if your husband treats your family members the way you treat his family members, would you be happy? If your wife treats your, her family, your family members the way you treat her family members, would you be happy? If we use the golden rule every day in our life, even within each other, if you treat others the way you want them to treat you, my friends, you will not have problems. You will not have problems. So you have less problems, reduce problems in your life as an individual and as a couple. Okay, so we're going to go to the next one. Remember that all that glitters is not gold, okay? When you get married, everything might look like the man has everything, everything is just fine, everything is just glittery and everything. But things can happen in life, okay? You can get married today and I'm not being pessimistic, but I'm just trying to be balanced here. Your husband may not have as much or your wife must not, might not have as much as when you got married. There is a place of adjustment. There is a place of you being accommodating. Some women, as soon as the man maybe loses the kind of job or the kind of salary or the kind of financing that he brings home, they start to talk him down. They start to be mean to him. They have no regard to him. They just spew things out of their mouth. And you're like, is it not the same lady that 
related with me differently when I had money. That's not Christianly. That is not Christianly. Because the man might be up today, tomorrow he goes down. But your value, he will add value to you when you are a constant. When he knows that he can depend on you. When he knows that he can rely on you. When he knows that no matter the situation he finds himself, you never look down on him, you never talk him down. And the same with a woman. When you marry the woman at the beginning, you treat her like an egg. But after a couple of months or years into the marriage, you just start to treat her anyhow. It hurts. Just remember that your marriage is com- it's, it's a complete package. And no matter how it goes, no matter what happened, no matter the event, no matter this, God forbid, sickness or challenges that come your way, remember the beginning and treat her or him as nice as you did when it's still a new wife, a new thing. Don't let familiarity make you to start to trivialize that thing that you held with great esteem. People don't tell you, and most people will not tell you that there is a, an adjustment phase in marriage. The first two, three years of marriage, there's a phase of adjustment. And if you're not careful, when you come into marriage as a newlywed, you feel that, ah, I think I married wrong. I think that this person is not the right person for me because of the challenges that start happening. Because it's usually um, a difficult stage in, in the marital relationship. Okay, It's a time when you start to understand each other you come with your difference, she comes with her difference. And then you start to like see things that you didn't notice at the beginning of, of, of your courtship. You know, you thought that she's this sweet person, but you didn't know that in the morning she can wake up and be sulky, right? So you never knew that this man is the kind of person that when you tell him, oh, um, can you please put things this way and he's not doing it like that or he's not doing it as quick as you expected him to. And then you start getting offended. You start getting irritated. They start to irritate you. Everything that they say starts to irritate you. My friend, it's an adjustment phase. Learn to understand. Learn to remember. When you get married, many of you are not married yet. When you get married, when you go through that adjustment phase, Give yourselves a lot of benefit of doubt. Accommodate each other. Be patient with one another. Okay, And if it's too much that you are losing it, don't go to your single friends and ask for advice. They might not be, they won't have the best advice for you because they've never been where you are. Get a family that you respect. A family that you see that they are matured, they've maybe been married for maybe 10 years or more, matured couple that have gone through all these phases and they can share their own experience with you and let you understand that, yes, it's an adjustment phase. It has it happens to everyone. You're not the first person this will happen to. You're not going to be the last person. But it doesn't mean that you have married wrong because you're having misunderstanding, because there's conflict, because he's beginning to say, oh, no, you, you don't respect me. Why are you talking to me like that? And then you feel, oh, you don't love me. Why are you ignoring me? Why are you not, you know, why, why are you not, like, listening to whatever I'm telling you? You know, you don't have to be, you know, completely disappointed and broken. No, you might cry, yes, which is normal, which is part of emotions. When you're not happy, it's natural for you to cry as a woman. As a man, it's natural for you to feel like your head is hot and I can't handle her. This woman is difficult and all that. Oh, she's childish. Some men will say, oh, yeah, she's so childish. I didn't know you are so childish. No, she's not childish. She's adjusting. Let her grow into the marriage. You are also growing. It's a growing phase. 
just know that it's just a phase in your marriage. Your individual differences are coming to clash. But with patience and love, you pass through that adjustment phase and then your marriage becomes sweet. I can tell you from experience, I've been married for over a decade. I have been through that stage. It's a time of discovery. And sometimes you're like, what the heck? How did I get into this marriage? How did I get here? What is all this? But if you are patient enough, then you come to enjoy your marriage and you'd be able to ex help another young couple in the future. So people might not tell you the extent at which they went through the adjustment phase. Some people, the adjustment phase is so bad that they might even leave the home. Uh, someone I was reading about online said that during the adjustment phase, they almost, I think they even divorced and remarried or they, they had a separation, a physical separation where they all went their separate ways. They just couldn't stand each other anymore. The man was irritating the woman. The woman was irritating the man. They couldn't just, they were like cat and dog. They couldn't live together in the same house. They had to go away for some time. I don't know, she rented a small apartment or he went away and rented a small apartment and um, get, got some counseling. Afterwards, they came back together. But as Christians, of course, I don't expect it to go that bad. I expect you to get advice from your pastors, from your leaders. Pray a lot. Spend time to pray. In this early stage, many people have divorced because of it. But none of you, I pray, will divorce through or during this adjustment phase. Okay. So these are some of the things, and there's a lot of things that, that I would want to say. I know time is against us now. We've, we've shared a lot of things, but I just want you to know that it's important to study, to understand uh, the differences between both of you. And when you get married, know that you are unique. Each of you are unique. Your attributes are unique. Your personality are different. And as Tim LaHaye said, he said, learning to adopt to your partner's weaknesses while strengthening your own your own weaknesses is that adjustment stage it's a stage where you are learning the weaknesses of that person and then you are strengthening your own so your strength is there to support his weaknesses and he, his strength is there to support your own weaknesses okay so I hope somebody is getting, if you can hear me and you think that you're, you're getting some value, please give me a thumbs up, share this video with your friends and comment. If you have a question, please go ahead and ask your comment. So someone is asking, I can see your question, from when to when is the adjustment stage? The most adjustment stage is the early stage of your marriage. We're talking about from the first year of marriage. So some people, they go the first year, they do it well and then they adjust and they fit into the marriage and everything is good. Some people go into the second year. They still have those. They start getting better. The first year might be, first two months might be a little bit, well, the first month might be the honeymoon stage and you're discovering each other and everything is just fine and you're just in love and the sex is new, the everything is new and then it's fine until the third month and you start seeing things that you did not see during honeymoon, you didn't see during courtship. And so it can go between one year to two years. Some people say it goes all the way to three years. I hope that answers your questions, um, please, Ada. So it's just, it's a short time. I mean, you guys are married for a long time. Marriage is a long haul. You're going to get, get married and you're going to live together for you know, 30 years. Sometimes people have outlived. I mean, they've lived longer with their, they live longer with their spouse than they did with their parents. If you've married, if you marry at 20, 22, Okay, and you live until 100, you have lived longer with this man that you're marrying, longer than you did with your parents. So you have a long way to go. That's why you should learn to understand yourselves and tell yourself that come and stay, come here to stay. I'm staying with this man. If God gives us life and Jesus does not come, we're going to be together for a long, long time. So that first two years, try to understand each other. I just like a woman that gives back to a newborn baby. There's an adjustment phase, even as a mother. Okay. Because you, you, you start crying. I mean, I've been a mother. I know I am a mother. I know what it means. As a new mother, sometimes you're like, oh my God, this baby is so cute, so handsome, but oh my God, he's so clingy. 
I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I, I don't have my freedom anymore. I, I, I just don't know. I can't sleep as I used to sleep anymore. Now I don't sleep enough. Now I'm, I'm always tired. Now there's this little baby that just wants my attention. Those are some of the adjustments that comes for a mother. So every human being that start, that is involved in the change, marriage is a change, right? It's change from singleness to marriage, to, for, to the marriage life, to the married life. So that change, there's just going to be a period of adjustment. Okay, thank you. I got your answer. So thank you for asking that question. And I'm looking at my phone to see any more questions that might come. So you, 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 you. I'm happy that you are being blessed by this and that that you understand some of these things that we are talking about. So another point I'd like to add is that you should always give each other the benefit of doubt. Remember that you are humans, okay? You are humans. Don't always be quick to accuse your partner and always be on the accusing fence. Oh, you did this. You did that. You did this. You did that. Sometimes if you don't understand everything, you'd always be um, feeling like you're more righteous. Like, okay, I didn't do anything. Everything is him or everything is her. She's the one always at fault. No. No matter what it is, give yourself an opportunity to grow. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Explain it to him. Explain it to her. I don't like this. I don't like it when you do this. Please, if you can try your best not to do this to me because I don't like it. And give them an opportunity. Even if they make a mistake and they still do that thing that you don't like them to do one or two times, don't stop. Someone gave me an advice. He said, don't stop repeating to your partner what you don't like. And don't feel like, done, I'm throwing the towel in. I can't, we can you can't be helped. That's it. I'm done with you. We, you. There's nothing I can do to solve you. You're just you now, nothing. Devise other means to make them do what you want them to do. Help them to do what you want them to do. There are things that you can put in place. For example, your husband is the kind of person that when he takes his shirt, he doesn't hang it back. You can put hangers, I don't know, in the washroom or on the bed where he knows. So he remembers that, okay, the hunger is here. Put some little, little, um, I don't know how to say, tips or things that will remind him that this is what he ought to do. I know a family that put notes in their bathroom. They put it on the toilet, like on top of the, just right ahead on top of the um, toilet bowl, like just in the, in the washroom, in the toilet. They put, remember to flush always remember to pull, you know, flush. You have to flush. And then when this man is peeing or using the washroom, he remembers, that is whoever said, remember to flush. And then she puts another little uh, note that says, um, put all plates in the um, dishwasher. Dishwasher must remain empty. Oh, I mean, sorry. Um, sink has to be empty, put all dirty dishes in dishwasher. And then she pasted it there. And sometimes she comes and she changes the color so that she's calling him to the attention that he remembers that everything needs to go to the dishwasher. You need to rinse your plates and put it in the dishwasher. So put little, little, you know, uh, reminders around your house so that your partner and both of you can remember that this is how you want your house to remain. This is how clean you want it to stay. There are cues. Always use the cues. You know, there are some cues that you use to remind each other that maybe they are not doing, you know, have, have some languages, have some love languages that playfully you tell each other that please do this, or oh, you're not doing this, or oh, your sweetheart is now getting tired. Because you're not helping your sweetheart, you're helping, you're making your sweetheart work more. Look, you are making your sweetheart work more because you're not, you know, you're not putting things away when you take them and all those kind of things. And then play about it, laugh about it, joke about it. But at the same time, things will get done. If you can make it not a, a duty, but playtime. It might make it less stressful for you. You won't be like, you know, always angry, always upset. 
always, you know, you know, don't make it like don't be always serious. Sometimes turn these things to a joke. And the more you say it, it's just like a child. The more you say it, the more you say it, you you mold that person into what you want them to be. Okay. I know this is a very serious conversation that we're having here. And if you're not married today, I'm telling you, in many years to come, when you get married, you'd be happy that you you had this conversation because you you they might it might come back to you. You'd remember that oh okay this is this might be the stage I'm going through. This might be some of the challenges that I'm I'm encountering now, and uh, okay we'll we'll be fine. Remember to pray about everything. Okay, like this book, the power of a praying wife, woman, and you've not read that book. A married woman, you've not read that book. Please go and get it. It will help you. The power of a praying wife. As a wife, you need to pray. You need to pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. As a man, you need to pray for your wife. And someone said that the reason why some people feel depressed or feel unhappy about their state or their situation is because they have lost um, gratitude. They've forgotten to be grateful for the little things that come their way. While you are thinking, oh, my husband is not like so-and-so's husband who buy, who bought a, a, a Range Rover, and my husband is, has not bought me a mansion, my husband has not done this, my husband has not done that. If it takes some time to thank God that you have a husband, and that he loves you, and that he kissed you this morning, and that he helps you. And you think, and you even if you start to write down all the good things that your husband has done to you, by the time you go down through the list, you will no longer feel depressed or down or discouraged or disappointed that, oh, I shouldn't have married this kind of man or I should have married that kind of man or my life would have been this big if I had married so-so and so person and all those kind of things. You'd be able to not compare yourself with other people. When you're grateful about what you have, where God is taking you, what God has done for you, and you tell yourself, look, so many people don't have this that I already have. It will change your mood. It will change your mindset. You change your disposition during the day. And you know, the mood of a woman usually determines the tone of the home. If you are touchy, you are grouchy, you are gloomy, the whole home will be going that way. But when you are carrying yourself with a smile, the joy is flowing through you, you're just happy, you're just smiley, you're making everybody feel at ease, you are peaceful, it will reflect on your home. The children will be happy. Your husband will be relaxed. He'll do more things. He'll be empowered to try other things. So do anything that you can to remember these things that I have been able to bring to you. Adjustment stage. stage. Everybody has flaws. You have flaws, whether you like it or not. The man is may, may not be talking about your flaws. Doesn't mean that you don't have them. Everybody has flaws. Try to understand yourself. And then positive criticism is very important. You can criticize somebody positively. You're criticizing them, but you're not putting them down. So you are giving them tips and saying, oh, rather than saying, oh, you're, you're just useless. You can't do this. You, you did it bad. You can, rather than say that, you can say, okay, you know, if you've done things this other way, I think it would be better. You did it well. I really like how you did it. But if you've done it this way, if, you, if maybe this flower is red, it, it'll give a better outlook and it will look better. That's a positive criticism. That's a positive way of telling somebody something that was not okay or someone, something that doesn't look so okay, but that can, that can get better. You have positively chipped in what you want to add in without making it negative. So positive criticism is very important. So when you get married to somebody, they come with baggage. Marriage, people come to marriages with baggages. Okay? They might have inferiority complex that you never noticed. They might have emotional instability from the abuse or bad experiences they've had in the past. 
so many things. It's a period of you understanding each other and you adjusting and you helping each other. And even if both of you have similar experiences, it's easier. Then you tell yourself, okay, we've gone through these similar experiences and okay, we can get out of this and we can, we, we, we can try not to dwell in the past and move on to whatever life has for us. Life has a lot. The future is bright. We're going somewhere. Together, we're going to do great things. And when you work together as one, I'm telling you, you do great and great and great and great, great things. Okay? So when you get married, don't deceive yourself. There's no place for pretense. You might try to be whatever it is. Some ladies, I know a lady that if you went, she, she had a distant relationship and before she comes online, maybe on video to talk to her husband, to be, she wants to make sure that her hair looks good and all that. <laughs> she wants to make sure that her background looks good and all that. It doesn't matter. You are already, I mean, when you get married, there's no, there's no place for that anymore. If you have a body odor, he'll know. If you have anything that you have, it's open secret now. So marriage, there is no place for pretense because everything is out there. You can't sleep with, <laughs> you can't always, you know, hide your hair, how it looks. You can't put powder to sleep every night. You get to see your real person. So the earlier, the better you adjust to whatever it is. You, you just be yourself. You get to discover that this person, oh, that looks so flashy and everything is not really that person that they are. So marriage is a time to discover. It's a revelation stage. It's a revelation place. You discover the real deal and there is no hiding. So there's a lot of things about marriage that many people don't tell you. There's financial responsibility. There is finance, finance, wants, need, expenses, expenses. And sometimes there are also spiritual battles that people fight. When you get married, you don't know if you're going to have children immediately. But when you come ready spiritually, then whatever you face in that marriage, you'd be able to stand you would be able to go on. And this is not to scare you. Everything that we've said today is not to scare you. It's just to give you a glimpse of the reality, to let you know that marriage is more than the wedding day. There is more to marriage than just the wedding day, the white dress, the smiles, the flowers, the congratulations, and this, this, the, you know, just the, the, the happy feeling that I'm the bride and the most important person in the day or the groom and the one, you know, I'm getting a bride and then some men think, oh yeah, now I'm going to have sex for free and everything. <laughs> marriage is more than that. Or even women, marriage is more than that. So when you get into marriage, don't be flattered by what you see on the internet. Marriage is deeper than just the pictures that you see on the internet. People don't show you everything. People come on the internet, sometimes they show you their best part. It's only when you come close that you begin to see that, oh, that beautiful couple that always smiling, nice picture, kissing each other on the cheek and everything. So they have challenges. So they can fight. So they can have misunderstandings. So this man is bearing this and not saying anything. So this woman is managing this. So don't let anybody push you into getting married. If you're not ready, if you're not ready, don't jump into marriage. Marriage is not a competition. Getting married is not by competition. Oh, all your friends are getting married. You need to get married now. No, if you're not ready to get married, do not get married. I know a young person and I admire her a lot. The fact that everybody was getting married, even though somebody had proposed to her and somebody has dropped her name by the marriage committee. She went to the marriage committee and tell, told them she's not ready. She's graduated. She's gotten a job and everything. But she said, I am not ready for marriage yet. That's a sincere person. She felt that she had, there's a lot of things she can still do with her life. There's a lot of flying she wants to do, a lot of discovery she wants to do. And she wasn't ready for marriage. And she clearly told the marriage committee that she wasn't ready for marriage. The fact that somebody has dropped your name at the marriage committee doesn't mean that you must get married in, immediately. One of the leaders I respect so much on the internet said that he proposed to his wife, but it, it took six years before they got married, before they started to live as man and wife. So you can propose to each other 
And if you're not ready to get married, you don't have to physically come together yet. Do not be in, in, in a hurry. Now our society these days is filled with broken marriages. People are living, some people are even not broken, but living together like uh, tenants. The love is no more there. It's faded, it's gone because they did not manage the whole marital stages. They did not manage um, all these things adequately. And before you know it, it's such a beautiful marriage that God brought together. It's crumbling. Because, because many used today, you think that, oh, marriage is just wedding. And many people are not ready for wedding, for marriage. They are only prepared for the wedding. They are preparing for the wedding. They think they have the money. But it's better to marry late than to marry wrong. Do not be in a hurry to marry. Because marriage is deeper than what you see. Comes with responsibility. You would have children to take care of very soon, even if you don't do it immediately after marriage. You would eventually have children. And of course, everybody is praying to have children in marriage. But if you yourself as a man or a woman, you're not matured enough, what kind of children are you going to breed? What kind of children are you going to train? What kind of children are you going to introduce to the world? It's a food for thought. Think about it. I need to be ready because there are some little human beings that I'm going to have to invest into but if i have nothing to invest then they'll just be free to run in the world and that's why you see broken children because they are children from fathers or mothers that were not even ready and did not even want them so they had nobody to 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 mold them they grew all alone they're just there in the world freely just going about and just learning adjusting learning from everybody from the good from the bad from the ugly they're just all over the place so i hope that somebody has learned something from this i hope that you understand that there is more to marriage than just attraction but compatibility is very important and marriage is easier to get into but it's very difficult to get out of because marriage comes with baggage. Even if you break, even if, those who have divorced will tell you that their, their life is never the same. Children will be there, emotional wreckage will be there. So if you're going to get in there, make sure you're getting in at the right time with the right person for the right reasons. No matter how you look today, young lady, when you get married, your body will change. It will no longer be the same, but you are still you. And you marry the right person that loves Jesus so much, they will love you unconditionally. And as a man, you marry a sister that loves Jesus and fears the Lord. She will respect the order of submission in the marriage, love in the marriage, and commitment in that marriage. Now, I hope that you've been blessed. If you have been blessed, please let me know what are the points that spoke more to you, what blessed you more in this conversation, uh, what was what is the take out lesson for you from here, and what other questions do you have, what do you want us to talk about, Please do well to let us know if we cannot answer this question today, we would always answer in our next um, live. We try to do this as much as possible every Saturdays, except if we have programs that we cannot get um, to come here. Like for example, on church programs, we will not be able to come here. Or if events that are beyond our control happens then you will not be able to come here and then we'll try to be letting you know uh, when we cannot come here god bless you so much and um in the group and on the page 
If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, do well to subscribe. I will see you at another time. God bless you. And bye.